Geographers, hello. Uh, third carbon cycle video. What is it all about then? Let's get on with it. Uh, basically, it's about how human activity affects the natural greenhouse effect, uh, and we cause the enhanced greenhouse effect, and then how that has an effect on the climate in different parts of the world, its impact on different ecosystems that are particularly vulnerable and also the water cycle. So it's like synoptic link heaven, this part of the course. Uh, links to loads of different uh, parts of the course synoptically. All right then, so we'll kick off with the easy bit, which is just about the concentration of atmospheric carbon being increased by humans. All right, so if we just have a look at... This, these few graphs showing greenhouse gas concentrations in parts, uh, parts per million and for methane parts per billion. And you can see that from the turn of the Industrial Revolution to, to present day, there's been an exponential increase. So it's not just a linear increase, it's a steady increase. It's your typical hockey stick, J-curve type pattern. So it's rising super quick. Uh, and if we have a look at what the greenhouse effect is, well, you can see that the sun's energy travels towards Earth. It gets into the atmosphere. Uh, it can be absorbed by dark surfaces such as land and oceans, uh, which is a good thing because it stops us from freezing to death. But it can also be reflected back towards space by uh, light surfaces such as ice for instance and that process is called albedo all right and naturally we've got these greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere that trap some percentage of this heat inside the earth's atmosphere so rather it going back into space it traps it now i must stress that on the left hand side of this graphic this is natural and it's perfectly a perfectly good thing all right it stops us from freezing to death however the enhanced greenhouse effect that's the key distinction you must use that word in the exam is where we burn fossil fuels we deforest we change land use uh, and we release more greenhouse gases into the upper atmosphere that trap more heat uh, than what would be trapped naturally. All right. So the gases are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So it's a similar. Uh, the only difference between these two graphics is there's more greenhouse gases on the right and more heat trapped than on the left. It's not natural. Yep. Right. And if we just have a quick look at, well. Kind of one of the drivers of that, or one cause of it. Uh, energy consumption in by by regions, if you like. You can see the overall pattern or trend is that it's increasing from uh, just under 4 billion metric tonnes of oil equivalent in 1965. And 2013, it's what, around about 13, yeah. And you can see the regions of the world that are responsible for that increase. Right. Uh, you can also see what kind of energy mix uh, is, is being used as well. So, I mean, have a look. Oil, coal, gas. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you look at that graph, uh, vast majority of, of kind of the energy consumption is coming from burning fossil fuels. There's only a small percentage coming from nuclear, which is purple, from hydroelectric power uh, and other renewables. Yeah. So it looks like a pretty grim state of affairs. A uh, couple of key words. One that links directly to what I've just been talking about is climate forcing, which it's where basically 
any drivers that cause the climate to change. Uh, so the most significant one is obviously human activity and burning fossil fuels. Uh, of all the carbon sinks, you know, soil is a is a significant one, uh, and you can you can I'll introduce this term soil carbon balance. So if plant residue is added to the soil at a faster rate than organisms convert it to CO two, then it's in effect sequestered from the atmosphere into the soil. All right, so you increase in the store of of uh, carbon into the soils and it becomes a carbon sink okie cokey right that's just a bit of a recap of last lesson let's have a look at the impacts then and i'm going to cover these briefly and introduce them uh, so give it a sub in the impacts of enhanced greenhouse uh, the greenhouse effect and climate forcing. So what are the impacts of humans actually burning fossil fuels and pumping more CO2 and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? Well, we'll start with the more straightforward one. Uh, vulnerable ecosystems and habitats are at risk. So give it another sub -heading. Ecosystems and habitats. The two that are most vulnerable... Pull these to the side, wait. I love my pictures then. Is the tundra biome in the Arctic. Alright, so Polly polar bear or Pauline the polar bear. Uh, lots of sea ice is melting, so they've got to swim further to catch a seal. So it is affecting these ecosystems, it's affecting the polar bear's habitat and the oceans as well. It's not just land based. Uh, mammals for instance you know fishing fisheries and uh, fish stocks are affected as well in the oceans but the tundra biome in the arctic is very vulnerable and another one that's very vulnerable we all love a bit of finding nemo don't we uh yeah is coral reef biomes uh when the oceans get warmer and the sequester more and more carbon out of the atmosphere they become more acidic and coral reefs have got a really kind there's a narrow kind of range where their ecosystem can function in terms of temperature but also in terms of uh yeah in, ter in terms of acidity of the oceans as well so uh very vulnerable lots of the great barrier reef in australia is bleaching and uh, dying so yeah right let's just put so that is an impact the next one is number two the impact on the thermo hairline circulation which as you will all know is the third carbon pump all right so our oceans play a vital role in sequestering uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere when it diffuses into the oceans yeah, and into the oceans and you know it don't want to be still it wants to be moving and pumping and uh, the thermo hairline circulation the ocean currents in the world's oceans kind of help help it's the final bit of the jigsaw and the third pump now just have a look at this the warmer surface water currents uh, if the thermo hairline circulation stops or slows down, I mean, it's going to have pretty big impacts uh, for the UK because we rely on the, this kind of heat or this energy from the prevailing winds to keep our climate nice and mild and moist. If this uh, thermo hairline circulation stops, then the UK is going to get an awful lot colder. All right, so if you're a bit nesh, you know, you might want to go to uh, go and buy some woolly mitts and some thermals because yeah, impact of climate change. The UK will become a lot colder. Right. So that's that one. The next impact. Look at this, my favourite game show, Tipping Point. 
All right. I think why the bloody hell as they put that in? It'll all become clear in a minute. But a key concept in geography, a synoptic concept, what the examiner's going to be loving if you talk about it in the exam, is what's called feedback loops. So we can have positive and negative feedback loops. A positive feedback loop is when you've got a snowball effect. All right. So we get climate forcing and uh, global warming from the enhanced greenhouse effect, which means there's less snow and ice because it melts, which means it can't reflect that radiation back into space as albedo. So more heat's absorbed by the land and sea, temperatures get warmer, and then it snowballs and it gets worse and worse. <coughs> the other feedback loop is permafrost thaw. Now permafrost is permanently frozen uh, ground or soil and in it is trapped methane which is a greenhouse gas now just like with this feedback look if you just follow follow this round again in a cycle uh, we get global warming all right that then causes the tundra or the permafrost uh, to thaw and when it thaws it releases the methane which goes into the atmosphere and traps more heat and causes enhanced global warming, which causes more permafrost to thaw, more methane to be released, and it's a vicious cycle. All right. And there is one other feedback loop, which is uh, forests. When forests, when you get forests die back and forests and trees die because of drought, uh, they release that CO2 back into the atmosphere. All right, and then again, that can kind of spiral out of control as well. I left the more complicated one to last. Uh, the water cycle and climate. Now, uh, well, it varies regionally, all right? So whereas global warming affects the whole planet, kind of the water cycle and the climate is predicted to experience different impacts in different regions so there's that many i have jotted them down i'll be honest with you because my memory is failing me as i get older uh, well the first thing is that the cryosphere will shrink and get smaller so glaciers will melt ice caps melt permafrost thaws uh, sea ice decreases any you know the, the cryosphere shrinks simple as that what else is the uh, more severe and intense depressions at mid latitude like the UK more severe and intense tropical storms hurricanes typhoons uh, and cyclones uh, in in tropical uh, tropical latitudes all right so they're becoming more frequent and more intense and more severe so risk is increasing what else is there i know there's other things oh monsoons uh locations like uh south asia for instance india bangladesh that sort of area uh monsoons become more unpredictable so they might arrive late not at all uh, or become more intense the the fourth one is el nino and la nina are becoming more unpredictable and more severe and intense. So ENSO, which is the is the term uh, for El Nino and La Nina, are kind of becoming more unpredictable and more intense. What else is there? Uh, ah, yeah. So by region then. Here we go. Uh, yeah, some regions are going to become warmer and drier and suffer from drought. Some regions are going to become wetter and suffer from more storms. Uh, along with that, coastal areas are more at risk because of storm surges. But I think we also need to pull in at this point, probably the most trickiest bit, so strap yourselves in. It's the inf 
impact on the global atmospheric circulatory system. Now, I'm going to make this super big. Give it a bit of, a, bit of an introduction. Yeah. Let me get rid of all this. Oops. Get rid of neat. Oops. I'll pause it. Right then. If we start at the equator, then obviously the sun's uh, energy is is more intense and focused at the equator. So what happens is is we get air rising, all right, uh, and we get a lot of convectional rain and thunderstorms at the equator. Yep. Uh, and this is obviously low pressure because air is rising from the ground surface into the atmosphere. And the weather or the climate at these latitudes in the ITCZ or near the equator is going to become uh, more extreme rainfall, more evaporation uh, because there's more convectional rainfall. All right. So that's at the equator makes sense. Now, when this air rises, it can't carry on rising into space, because that just can't happen. So it can only go one way. It's got to go out, all right, which, if we use the compass direction, is north and south. And at a certain point, it starts to sink. And then we get a band of high pressure uh, where we find deserts like the Sahara. So... You know, these are going to become very, or even more dry and, uh, and and desertified. Then, some of that air comes back towards the equator at the ground surface uh, to actually complete the loop. Some of it heads north uh, into the feral cell. And again, it reaches a certain latitude and it will start to rise. So... At the equator, we've got low pressure at around 30 degrees north and south. Air descends, so we get high pressure and settled conditions. And then, just here, we get low air pressure and rising air again. And this just alternates until you get to the poles, which is high air pressure, and they're known as cold deserts. Hardly ever snows. Uh, at the south or the North Pole, uh, but it's very, very, very cold. So, you know, if we think, well, if the planet's getting warmer, uh, then obviously it's going to interfere with the this global atmospheric circulation system. So on average, Earth becomes warmer, there's more evaporation and more rainfall. Weather patterns are going to be kind of more extreme. We're going to have more floods and intense depressions at mid-latitudes like the UK. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have more storm surges. And we're also going to have increased drought at places like Australia. Yep, northwest Australia are predicted to suffer from more extreme drought. All right, what do I want you to do? Well, I just want a summary of the impacts, really, uh, from this lesson. We covered some of the early stuff at the start, uh, in, in the previous lesson. So if you can just summarise under the headings that we had before. Uh, brilliant. Bring your notes to lesson. See ya.